In many diagrams of rocket engines, including the ones used in previous videos of this series, the propellant appears to just enter the combustion chamber through simple pipes. But this isn't really the case in actual rocket engines. While just pumping the propellant in through some large pipes would work, it wouldn't work very well, as doing so would mean the propellants aren't properly mixed or atomized, causing combustion hotspots and instability. And unless the combustion chamber was ridiculously long, a lot of unburnt fuel would be flying out the end of the nozzle. In order to avoid these issues, the fuel must enter the combustion chamber through one of the more complex and precisely machined parts in a rocket engine, the injector. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Lift off. Lift off. Lift off. We have a lift off. 32 minutes past the hour. Lift off on Apollo 11. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hot head. Nice to be in orbit. There are dozens of different designs for injectors, but they all serve the same basic purpose. They use their geometry to evenly distribute, mix, and atomize the propellant entering the combustion chamber. Now, although they all achieve the same thing, the many different designs of injectors can vary a lot. And there's no single typical injector design, although many designs have converged on somewhat similar types. These various designs all offer advantages and disadvantages over each other, and differ in complexity and in mixing efficiency. Some injectors also have additional functionality to improve rocket engine operation. Now, mixing of the propellants is important, obviously, because fuel and oxidizer molecules need to be near each other in order for combustion reactions to occur. Atomization is also very important for complete combustion. You might already know that if a container of gasoline is lit on fire, it isn't the liquid that burns, but the vapors coming off the surface. The same sort of thing happens with rocket propellants. If there are big drops of propellant, they are only going to burn on their surfaces. So the propellants must be vaporized in the combustion chamber for good combustion to happen. Once a rocket engine is started, it gets very hot, which causes the droplets of propellant to vaporize pretty fast, but not instantly. And with the speeds these fluids are moving through the engine, they don't have very much time to work with. The time to vaporization for a drop of fuel largely depends on its size. Having a few large drops of fuel means relatively little surface area relative to their volume, meaning it takes a long time to vaporize them. But many small droplets will have much more surface area, allowing for much faster vaporization. It should be noted that having poor mixing and atomization of the propellants isn't as much of a problem as long as the combustion chamber is very large, because there will be more time between the fuel entering and leaving the combustion chamber for turbulence and heat to mix and vaporize them. However, this also means increased weight and material costs. You'll notice many early rocket engines had quite large combustion chambers when compared to modern rocket engines. If the combustion chamber is too small, then some of the propellants will not burn until after they flow through the nozzle, meaning the heat energy released by combustion isn't being converted into thrust, resulting in lower engine efficiency. Poor injection can also make starting the engine more difficult, as starting a rocket engine can already be a difficult process. Making sure a region in the engine has properly atomized propellants with the proper mix ratio is key to reliable engine starts. Now one of the simplest types of injectors is the showerhead injector, named for the fact that it works exactly like a showerhead. In this design, the propellants are just sprayed through several small holes into the combustion chamber. This really isn't too much different than having propellant lines feed directly into the combustion chamber, but offers significantly better atomization, allowing the propellants to mix and burn much faster. This type of injector can be machined quite easily, and might only consist of a few parts, making it the king of simplicity. But due to its relatively poor performance, it hasn't seen much use since the early days of rocketry. To increase the mixing efficiency, the injector can be designed so that the propellant flows hit each other as they exit the manifolds. This is known as an impinging injector, and almost all injector designs use impingement in some form, even as early as the 1920s. Simple impinging injectors aren't much harder to manufacture than showerhead injectors, and look very similar. The only difference is the holes are drilled at an angle and face each other, so that the propellant streams intersect. Because of the adequate efficiency and simple construction, these are the most common injector type for amateur and university-built rocket engines. But for rocket engines with larger budgets, a spray type of injector is more common. This type uses more complex geometry, often by using swirlers or pintles, to spread the propellant into cylindrical or conical patterns. These types of injectors provide better atomization than the more simple injectors, and allow the propellant to be more evenly distributed in the combustion chamber. Additionally, injectors using the pintle design 
kind have been shown to have much better throttling capabilities. This is because the pintle itself can be used as a valve to control the flow rate accurately, and because the spray pattern resulting from the injector results in less combustion instability than other designs. Many engines using pintle injectors have a single large pintle feeding the entire combustion chamber. You've probably seen a pintle injector firsthand if you've ever used one of these garden hose nozzles. The only major difference being that in a bipropellant rocket engine there would be flow for both the fuel and the oxidizer flowing coaxially at different angles so they impinge on each other. Here's a diagram showing the pintle injector on the Apollo descent engine. This is the engine used by the Apollo lander when it was going down to land on the surface of the moon. Oxidizer in blue flows down and is directed outward through a series of holes where it impinges on the fuel shown in red. There is a movable sleeve which when moved forward increases the area available for both the fuel and the oxidizer to flow through, increasing flow rate. This design allowed the engine to throttle down to just 12% of the rated full thrust, something almost no other rocket engine at the time was capable of. Now, with almost all injector designs, the propellant must be distributed between dozens or even hundreds of tiny holes. Having hundreds of tiny little pipes going to each hole would be a rather inelegant solution, so instead we use a manifold, that is a hollow section that we connect one big pipe to and let the propellant flow into. Then this manifold has all the tiny holes either directly drilled into it or separate inserts or plates attached to it that contain the holes. As manifolds can have a much larger area for the propellant to flow through, the velocity of the flow can be much lower, which reduces losses and simplifies the analysis of the fluid mechanics at play. The issue that still exists though is that having a manifold, or in the case of a bipropellant rocket, two manifolds with hundreds of little tiny inserts guiding the flow of propellant that can often be at cryogenic temperatures, well that still poses quite the engineering and manufacturing challenge. These challenges are what makes rocket science so difficult and expensive. So now that we understand most of the basic ideas of what an injector is, let's take a look at the F1 engine's injector. The F1, of course, is the rocket engine that powered the first stage of the Saturn V, the rocket that brought humans to the moon. At the top of the injector stack is the lock stone, which is a manifold that the liquid oxygen flows through. Under that is the injector plate itself, which was made from stainless steel to prevent corrosion by the liquid oxygen. Surrounding the injector is the fuel manifold. So looking at the injector plate, we can see that oxygen enters from the top and fuel enters from the sides. The bottom of the injector plate had 31 concentric grooves machined into it, with each of them alternating between fuel and oxidizer. The tiny holes the oxidizer flows through are just vertically drilled through the entire plate, from the oxidizer grooves at the bottom up into the oxygen dome. The fuel flows from the manifold on the sides through several fuel passages, which run radially in between the oxidizer holes. Then holes are drilled from the fuel grooves up into these passageways. Into each of those 31 grooves, a copper ring is inserted, which has many small holes drilled into it. These holes are what sprayed the propellant into the combustion chamber. These rings were made from copper because of its high thermal conductivity, which allowed it to be more effectively cooled by the cryogenic oxygen. Both the oxidizer and the fuel holes in the bottom of the injector face were designed to cause the propellant streams to impinge as they exited the injector. In total, there were 2,832 holes for propellant to flow out of the injector. I imagine the machinists making these got sweaty palms as they neared the end of manufacturing, knowing that messing up even a single hole could turn a part that takes hours to make into a piece of scrap. These were very expensive parts to manufacture, and the parts had to survive having liquid oxygen at negative 180 degrees Celsius and over 100 atmospheres of pressure on one side, and the combustion chamber at 3,200 degrees Celsius and over 60 atmospheres on the other side. A very impressive feat. Rocket engine injectors, while simple in theory, just a bunch of holes for propellant to flow through, are subject to extreme operating conditions and are vital to the smooth operation of the engine. They are one of the features that differentiates a rocket engine from a big flamethrower. Hey everyone, you might have noticed that this video was posted a few <coughs> years after the previous video in the series. I actually started writing the script for this video shortly after posting that previous video, but then I took a brief hiatus to finish getting this very expensive piece of paper. Needless to say, I'm quite happy with it. I mean, just look at the subtle off-white coloring, the tasteful thickness of it. It's very nice. But now I have, comparatively, infinite free time to make videos again. I think I have a few more topics to cover in this series, but if you have a topic you'd like to see a video about, anything science or engineering related, leave a comment down below. Anyways, this has been Space is Kinda Cool. Thanks for watching.